Westchester, New York. Before we get started, though, I have a special um, introduction I wanted to make of our Ostomy Awareness Day champions of this year. Danielle and Joe of Double Bagginet. How are you both? We are awesome. Thank you for having us on. So what would you like to tell us? Enlighten us about Ostomy Awareness Day. Give us you know, a little something before we move on with our talk. Uh, first of all, we're super honored to be the champions <laughs> this year. And we've been bringing, can everyone see them? There we go. We've been bringing our little Ostomy mascot everywhere we go. And we've been spreading lots of awareness yeah. for the last few weeks. Yeah, this is Sir Poops a lot. You can download your own from ostomy.org uh, slash ostomy dash awareness dash day. And because Ostomy Awareness Day is really truly every day. Every single day. And <laughs> Ostomy Awareness Day is a day to spread awareness, uh, educate uh, the general public about what it, life is like uh, living with an ostomy to help remove the stigma of ostomies. Thank you both so, so much for joining us for this brief cameo. Uh, give it up for a double bag in it. Thank you for joining thank us. You yes, all. thank Happy you. Happy Awesome Awareness thank Day. You so much. Now to move forward with our talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Bedell and Alex for, um, you know, bearing with us with a brief cameo that we just had. I wanted to move forward and talk a little bit about ostomies and mental health care today. So with that, I just wanna say some people view living with an ostomy as a new lease on life. Yet for others, it might feel very devastating. Some people have a strong support system while others feel alone and isolated. In honor of Ostomy Awareness Day, which was October 1st yesterday, um, let's talk about the emotional impact of living with an ostomy and provide some support and guidance. As I mentioned earlier, I'm Tina Swani Omprakash. Um, I'm a Crohn's patient and health advocate uh, running the blog ownyourcrohns.com and the nonprofit South Asian IBD Alliance, and I'll be your moderator for today's chat. So with that, I'd love to introduce today's speakers a little bit more. Um, so I wanted um, Dr. Bedell and Alex, can you tell us a little bit more about yourselves. Um, I know uh, one of you is a gastropsychologist. Alex, you're a stoma nurse. Can you tell us a little bit more about your practices and how you work with patients? Sure, I can kick us off. So I'm Elise Bedell. As you said, I'm a gastropsychologist. Um, I'm currently at the University of Chicago. Um, where my work is primarily focused on our patients with gastrointestinal diseases. Um, and I also um, have an additional specialty of working with patients who have sexual dysfunction, um, which I do both patients on their own um, who may have sexual dysfunction without other health concerns, but primarily focus on working with our folks who have GI concerns, including ostomies um, and helping them get back to the sexual function at the way they'd like. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Alex? Yep, uh, my name is Alex Anningalan. I'm, a, as you said, a stoma nurse. Um, my specialty is in wound and ostomy care. I am currently the, a certified wound and ostomy nurse in New York Presbyterian at their campus in Westchester. Uh, my practice is uh, concentrated on both wounds and ostomies, specifically for ostomies. Um, we deal with uh, the whole of the preoperative, postoperative phase, and have the transition to discharge from the hospital. Um, I work mainly with adult and geriatric patients, um, but uh, as you know, in the hospital, everything is varied. So uh, that's me and my practice. Thank you for the invitation to join today's discussion. Thank you both so much. Um, so before we kick off our conversation, I just wanted to go over a few quick things of housekeeping. Um, the information provided during today's chat is meant for educational purposes only. It should not replace any advice that you receive from your gastroenterologist, primary care provider, nurse, nutritionist, or colorectal surgeon. If you have any questions about any specific care, please reach out to your healthcare provider. If you have any questions about IBD that are not answered during today's chat, you can contact uh, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's IBD Help Center by calling 1-888-MY-GUT-PAIN or emailing info at Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org. So today's program is generously supported in part by a sponsorship from Takeda. Additional support is provided through the foundation's annual giving program and donors. Now to kick this off, um, I have a question specifically for Dr. Bedell. 
Um, Dr. Bedell, can you tell me from your experience as a gastropsychologist, what are some of the common social and emotional concerns your patients share with you when they're considering ostomy surgery? Yeah, I think first and foremost, um, stigma is an area that I would highlight. And I would say that stigma is something that might actually um, encompass lots of other areas of a person's life um, that they might also then identify as concerns. So, so when we talk about stigma, it might mean that a person is thinking about how is this going to be to adjust to dating with an ostomy, to adjust to being sexual with my partner or my spouse. Um, it might mean stigma like what am I going to do if I need to tell my employer about this change, either scheduling the surgery and going through those adjustments? Or I think a lot of people I work with also are in are in the types of jobs that have some manual labor component where there are concerns about, am I going to be able to keep my job um, after I have this surgery? Um, and so I think that, you know, it can both be practical concerns like how is my body going to work? Am I going to be able to be strong enough? Is this going to get in the way of the things that I want to do in terms of traveling, in terms of, like you said, like I said, occupational functioning? But I think that then there's this other side of it that's also, how am I going to feel about my body? How are other people going to look at my body in the context of these other domains? Um, I would also say that um, there's an intersection of diet, for example, that oftentimes can be a concern for people as they're considering an ostomy surgery. What changes might I need to make after they have an ostomy? How do I kind of manage um, output appropriately in the context of diet? Um, and so a lot of these different intersections um, might be things that I work with a person on in conjunction with their medical provider in conjunction with a dietitian. Um, so I would say there's a, there's a lot of intersectionality when it comes to the, um, the psychosocial aspects of living with an ostomy or considering one. These are really great points, Dr. Bedell. I just wanted to um, pass it over to Alex in case he had any uh, remarks he wanted to add to that. I know some of us may not have access to an in-house gastropsychologist and I know I myself as a, as a patient have spoken to my stoma nurse sometimes about how other patients are dealing with this when uh, my ostomy was new. So I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts as well, Alex. Yeah, so from the stoma nurse perspective, it's, it's always uh, important to, we always tell our patients that we are available, um, that you are not alone in this journey. Um, there are always someone out there that's willing to help you, um, be it in any discipline, any specialty. Um, from my personal point, I always tell them you're not alone. You're never alone in this journey and there's someone that you can reach out to. The WOC nurses are also equipped. Uh, if you have one in your area, I'm pretty sure the WOC and society has a directory too, and as well as the UOAA. Uh, you can always search for someone to to find that um, emotional support that you need, so. Sounds yeah. good, thank you, Alex. Um, from my end, um, I just wanna share, you know, I could very much relate to what Dr. Bedell was talking about. And even Alex, you know, for me initially, um, I did not have somebody who could understand ostomy surgery well. And I often talk to my ost uh, ostomy nurse about it. And she invited me to um, the ostomy support group and even in the beginning, you know, I would barely talk. Um, and I would just listen because I just felt so ashamed of having my ostomy. Um, and the reason why I felt so ashamed was actually because I was dealing with a lot of stigma. As Dr. Bedell was talking about, um, stigma can pervade many aspects of your life. Um, for me, I think the predominant form of stigma that I was facing was cultural stigma. Um, in my culture, I'm of South Asian descent. My family's from India, Pakistan. Um, a, a lot of us view ostomies as something, you know, not just a last resort, but I hate to even use the word. Uh, it's almost viewed as disgusting. And people don't get married. People don't get jobs. You're not allowed to enter the temple or cook in the kitchen because you're considered impure. Um, and it's just, it's very, very challenging to navigate that stigma, even though I had seen this with my father and aunt who both had ostomies. Uh, it was very, very isolating for me um, because my family was saying, you know, Tina, you're not going to be able to get married with this thing, or you're not going to be able to lead a normal life. I just want to say that while people might have these assumptions or 
thoughts about an ostomy, none of that's actually true. Um, I live a much fuller life than I could have 15 years ago before my ostomy. Um, and I am able to do a lot of things that I wasn't able to do back then, including eat the things that I want, travel, um, be at a conference like I am right now. Um, and, uh, you know, I did get married and, you know, I, it, it, it really isn't quite um, the stigma that people make it out to be. It is what you make of it. Um, and I truly encourage everybody to, you know, open up that um, frame of mind to realize that this too can give us our lives back. So that's kind of my take on things. Now, Alex, I just want to move back to you. Um, how do you help ostomates, or how do you help patients prepare themselves both physically and emotionally for becoming an ostomate, for the change that this surgery will entail? Yes, yeah, so um, it always begins with that first uh, pre-operative visit, right? And sometimes it's not the most pleasant experience when patients are told that they would need to have an ostomy surgery, but we always see it as that's why we're here for you. Um, physically, we tell them that as with any other surgery, it would be an alteration in your body, but that is a temporary state. All of us and all of our bodies would adjust to bring it back to some sense of normalcy, right? We always use that approach. Um, also, it's important to see us as WOC nurses to make sure, um, although the most common task that is always expected of us is stoma siding, it actually has a lot of implications in the post-operative period. We find and we suggest the right location for the stoma to help you bring back uh, living life normally, right? Um, physically, we always tell them to maintain good nutrition in preparation for the surgery, right? And that is always also coupled with emotional preparation. It, there is always some sense of anxiety and um, that feeling of uh, uncertainty that is after the surgery. So we also have to deal with that. Um, we always tell... Um, people who would be undergoing surgery to always assure themselves that we are as human beings, that we can go through this, right? And we always have to have a support group, right? Um, there are people out there who you might think might not be able to help you, but are actually able to help you. So that's the first thing in mind is to have a mindset. We, we, we need to have a winner's mindset and that everything is gonna, go back to, or not even go back. Sometimes as Tina said, it might be better after surgery. Um, I can't count the number of patients that tell me after the surgery that they were able to reclaim their life back. Seeing at it that way is a good way of having emotional and physical preparedness. Great, and what do you advise for uh, caregivers? Like what kind of support um, and help uh, are you able to uh, give caregivers, meaning parents, partners, spouses, uh, through this journey? It is important to always, I always tell them to be with the person, right? Sometimes you don't even have to say anything, just being with them, being with them in every preoperative appointment, being with them after the surgery and staying with them in the hospital during their stay. Um, presence alone means a lot to the patient. And then um, also, um, in addition to presence, uh, give yourself, uh, like I, I always advise the support system to widen their perspectives and always um, try to understand what the person is going through so that they can actually help and uh, give us a stable support system. That, that, that sounds perfect. You know, these are all things that many of us need when going through this because we don't know who to lean on or how to get the support that we need. So I very much appreciate that. Um, now, Dr. Bedell, um, just going into the same question, how are you able to um, prepare patients and caregivers for ostomy surgery? Like, are there specific uh, tips or tactics that you have? Yeah, I think um, I would say not so much that there are specific strategies. If anything, I think it's this recognition that 
you know, that certainly I've developed over time and I share with um, each of my patients that each person's journey is not created equally. And so, you know, sometimes I work with people who might be referred to me by um, their gastroenterologist, colorectal surgery, uh, colorectal surgeon, or more often than not, their stoma nurse, um, who I have a very collaborative um, relationship with when I'm working with our, with our shared patients. Um, but I think there are times where they're referred and it turns out that person actually doesn't really need much of anything, that it's more of the anticipation of it. That's, um, that's, that's the, the biggest part of it. And once they actually have the surgery and go through the recovery, for some people, that process is pretty seamless. Um, and so I think recognizing that as much as we're talking about these potential, um, you know, social emotional concerns, some patients adapt really well and need very little outside of their own kind of natural um, support system. That being said, it's also not abnormal for people to need a lot more support than they may have thought they needed. Um, and so that's, that's, that's not, that's not abnormal either. And so a lot of, I guess, what I would say is a lot of what I do is just called normalizing. It's a reminder that whatever you're experiencing, it's not weird. It's not strange. It doesn't mean that you're broken. Um, and so if you need a little bit more then you know, I work with patients to identify, is it that you need to be able to work on having these conversations with your family and friends so that they can provide the right type of support? for you. doesn't always come naturally to people, even well-meaning people. They don't know the right type of support to give or how to give it. Is it that you actually need more help navigating the medical system? You need to be able to, to kind of foster better communication with your, with your medical team, with your stoma nurse, with your dietitian. right? These are things that I work with people on sometimes that can make a big difference. Um, so I would say that just keeping in mind that each person's journey can be very different uh, and, and one particular thing that I was thinking, um, actually, as Alex was talking as well, is just that, you know, some people don't, some people don't have that buildup period of being able to plan. Some of the folks that I see have had these surgeries very urgently, and that can also have a different, you know, can really shape their experience of, um, of, of whether they had the opportunity to sort of do this adjustment period. Some people have a little bit more say in whether they have the surgery, when they have the surgery, um, in terms of how many symptoms they were experiencing, how severely their quality of life was impacted by their symptoms and for how long. And those are things that I can really see sort of change the adjustment period for a person. Um, and so a person that wasn't expecting to have this surgery and they woke up and they have this, you know, new aspect of their anatomy, um, that can be a very different adjustment period than someone that maybe has been sort of readying themselves for this for a few years or, you know, a year or so. And so there are so many nuances that, um, that, you know, it's just none of us, uh, none of us, you know, the patients themselves, the providers like us that might be working with those patients and supporting them. We just can't really take a cookie cutter approach to this. So we just have to really work on meeting patients with where they're meeting people with where they're at. I think that's uh, such a good point um, about meeting people where they're at, because I just feel like there's such a wide gamut of experiences when you get an ostomy. Mine was very different from other patients that I speak to. And I think it's very important to consider, you know, that um, someone might have challenges that, you know, I may not have had or vice versa. So I, I think this has to be very tailored to the patient and their experience. Um, it makes a lot of sense, Dr. Bedell. Um, Dr. Bedell, I also wanted to just talk to you a little bit, you know, you've been mentioning about stigma, about, um, you know, uh, preparing for surgery. Um, what about the potential for negative self-image? I know that this is a challenge that I've had um, that I'm happy to speak about as well, but um, how are you sort of um, guiding patients or giving them tips um, uh, on coping with uh, body image shame or negativity that they might be experiencing or that negative sort of self-talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Um... For the most part, I think one of the one of the strategies, and it and it and it, it sounds a little counterintuitive, I think actually, is that there is a period that needs to happen of just actually accepting that there may be some negative self body, uh, negative body image, um, because it's a big 
change, right? And I think on top of that, you know, what can be very helpful is to to conceptualize a surgery like this, even if a person is very happy with the outcome, there is still some grief there typically, right? This is this kind of a change in a person's uh, life, in their body, in their the sort of former expectations that they had about themselves. As a psychologist, we would typically consider that somewhat of a loss. Even if it could mean moving forward in a very positive way, there is a grief process that needs to happen. And so that means that even if a person isn't clinically depressed, like when we think, oh, this person has a major depressive disorder, a person may still be quite depressed and quite anxious as they move through that transitional period. And that transitional period isn't just a month. Sometimes it's not even six months. When I'm meeting with a person, I think of several years as still adjusting, as still this is a pretty new experience for this person. And sometimes when I say that, when I reflect that back, my patients are like, really? Well, this was two years ago. I'm like, two years in the grand scheme of things, there's a lot that can still be changing in two years. Um, so I would say that um, that's that's just one, um, one aspect that I would pull out here. Um, uh, let's see. I might actually, if it's okay, I might toss it back to you and then I'm going to sort of regroup some other suggestions. Yeah, absolutely. Alex, did you want to add anything to that? Um, as far as negative self-image, are there patients who may bring that up to you? Um, or do you see a lot of that? It is actually, um, uh, a fairly common, um, uh, response among people who are about to go, uh, undergo surgery and immediately after, um, the negative self-image is actually there. And I like how Dr. Bedell um, stated that it is a reality and it's a matter of accepting. Um, most patients, if they don't receive the right amount of um, care and redirection, they would dwell into that negative self-image. So it is important for us to actually turn them back to towards a positive outcome and a positive view that although there is that sort of it, there is actually um, help and there is a way to counteract that negative self-image and that you can actually still live positively despite that, that feeling of negative self-image. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, Dr. Bedell. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'll just I figure I'd just jump back in and then Tina, I'm so excited, anxious to hear what you have to say too. Um, so I would say that, you know, accepting that, you know, that transitional stage and not essentially not beating, beating oneself up for having, you know, for sort of having this adjustment where maybe you aren't seeing yourself the way that you're used to. I think that's kind of first step. Um, but then I think second step that I, I usually try to help a patient, um, you know, see if they can reach is, is a body neutrality. I think that, you know, oftentimes in our culture, and this is, I think, pervasive, not just among people who have ostomies or have GI um, conditions more generally, but, you know, we have most, unfortunately, most uh, cultures in the world, we have pretty high standards um, for body image and what bodies are expected to look like. And so these are stories that most of us as people have inherited um, long before, you know, uh, long before we may have gone through changes in our body with aging or with having a surgery like this, right? Um, and then on top of this, um, it is, this is going to be a change, right? Your body may not look the way that bodies look in uh, movies or on magazines, right? In ads that you might see on TV. Um, and so really expecting that you're going to necessarily bounce back to this positive positive body image. Sometimes I think that's actually just, it feels a little bit unattainable for people because again, remember all humans, I think, unfortunately, body image struggles can be part of the human experience as awful as this is. So working towards first neutrality, feeling like, okay, like my body is, is working for me. Like this is a functional body. You know, this is a body that has gotten its health back. Um, and having moments where you can appreciate what you look like in the mirror and not, not have that negative self-talk, right? Just sort of have a more neutral self-talk. I would say that is actually a really good thing to aim for. And then hoping that with time, you can have moments of body positivity, like looking in the mirror and saying, you know what? I'm like, I'm looking pretty good today, right? 
But the expectation doesn't mean that you feel that every hour of the day, every day of the week. That's that's kind of not not the norm for most people. So why set a higher standard? So I think I think just sort of reaching for let's have a neutral relationship with my body. Let's get there. And that's when I think when, when, um, and I would say in my practice, you know, this is about conversations. This is about sometimes experimenting with what you're wearing, experimenting about situations that you're putting yourself in that can then get to that neutrality. And then you're looking for those little modifications, um, again, in sort of how you think, how you behave, what you do, who you surround yourself with that makes you feel beautiful, that can help increase those moments where you might really, really be happy with the skin that you're in. I think those are such good points um, that you're bringing up, Dr. Bedell, Alex. Um, for me, it's been an interesting journey. I've had a lot of surgeries. I'm on my fourth stoma now, so it's not my first rodeo. Um, so to speak, but I remember with every major surgery that I had, um, and really with every new stoma that I had, there was, um, yes, somewhat of a grieving period for me, but it was also an opportunity for me to prove the world wrong about the stigma. You know, that was really important to me. I needed to look beautiful. I needed to look sexy in my skin. I'm a young woman. I don't need to prescribe to what the world might think and feel about ostomy. I love that. I want to show the world something else. I want to teach people to own their ostomies. So I actually, you know, I've, I've gotten different haircuts. I've bought different, bought different wardrobes. I mean, with all the weight gain and loss too, with steroids on, steroids off. Like I, I would have like multiple wardrobes and I would try different colors, fun colors, um, fun scarves, accessories, anything that would make me feel like myself again and make me feel alive again. Look, I've been through hell and back. You know, I deserve to pamper myself and feel alive again. And my ostomy truly made me feel alive again. I think that it's important to emphasize that and experiment with things that make you feel like yourself again, make you feel whole again. Um, I did want to throw in a little bit of an anecdote. Um, I know you were talking about the grieving process, Dr. Bedell, but um, for me, the grieving process was very interesting. I actually was initially diagnosed with ulcerative colitis and was opting for a J pouch due to the cultural stigmas that I was facing around having ostomies. I really didn't want a J pouch. I actually really loved my ostomy. I was like, oh my God, I'm starting to gain weight again. Oh my God, I can eat like a normal person again. Like it was a rough recovery, don't get me wrong, because I had emergency surgery, but I was just like, I haven't felt this good in like a couple of years at that point. Um, and I was 85 pounds, uh, down 50 pounds, and I was here I was gaining weight again. Mm -hmm. So I'm going into J pouch surgery and I'm talking to my therapist, mind you, she wasn't trained in anything gastro related, but she's like, Tina, you're grieving the loss of your ostomy now. I was like, I have this thing that I can clean up every couple of days or three days, four days. And like, it takes care of me and I take care of it. I was referring to my stoma. I was seriously grieving my reversal. I did not know how to go into reversal surgery, if you can believe it, Mm -hmm. um, without, you know, no longer having the stoma and just having sort of the scar there. It was, it was a challenging time for me. I think when something can give you life back again, it is important to recognize what it has done for you and realize that there could be grief on either side of the coin. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I talk with people a lot about, you know, sometimes the the anger that people can hold literally. I mean, I say sometimes it sounds so hippy dippy, but you can hold sometimes so much anger in the areas of your body where you, where you have illness. And, and if that, if that is an experience that I am hearing from people, I usually say like shift some love there. Like it is, it is like your, your Crohn's disease or your ulcerative colitis or your ostomy, like this is your body trying its best to take care of you. And sometimes that shift in perspective can be so powerful. 
Um, and so I love hearing that. And certainly like, I, I think Tina too, you're, I think it's such a good thing to also share that other side of that is for some people, I mean, this is just such a, I mean, lifesaver we <laughs> have prominently oh, out there. We're on. <laughs> yes. I mean, it is such a lifesaver. And, um, and so there can also be so much joy, um, and so much gratitude in there too. And Hey, like, that's also, that's also a way that you can feel good in your body. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Dr. Bedell. Alex, I wanted to move back to you um, and talk a little bit about dating and intimacy. So Dr. Bedell brought this up a little earlier, and so I definitely want you to chime in as well, Dr. Bedell. But Alex, I wanted to hear a little bit about um, what you hear about dating and intimacy from Ostomets. Uh, it seems to be a frequent worry, totally understandable. I went through it as well as I was talking about marriageability. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about if and how ostomy surgery impacts a person's ability to be intimate physically? Yes, um, thanks for that question, Tina. And yes, it is a fairly common concern and a fairly common um, feeling for uh, persons who are about to go ostomy surgery, undergo ostomy surgery and immediately after. Um, we always tell them that um, in the immediate post-operative phase, the first goal first would be to heal, right? You have to let your body to heal first and try to regain uh, from the stress of surgery and from the stress of the procedure. Um, although there are some uh, surgeries that would uh, impact um, intimacy, we have to always say that eventually the body would try to adapt and that yes, you can go back to dating and intimacy. It is always also a question of, um, not actually a question, it, actually, it is actually that um, talking to yourself, that you are able to go back, also maintaining open communication with your partner. Um, there may be adjustments needed, but uh, the overall thought would be you can go back and have uh, a sense of that intimacy in dating. Uh, perhaps Dr. Bedell can also weigh in on this, but it is. Um, the immediate post-operative period, though, um, it, it's a reality. It's hard. Your body just underwent surgery. So after you go through that first hump uh, away from that stress, then you are able to regain it back. Absolutely. Um, that's great points, um, Alex. I did want to move over to Dr. Bedell and hear emotionally, um, how do you, like, help patients get back into the dating and intimacy world after ostomy surgery? Yeah, well, I think, um, again, I'll just always put that caveat out there that some people this happens really naturally, right? Although this is totally agree with, with Alex. I mean, this is very common, but also if you're listening to this, you're watching us and you haven't had the surgery yet, you know, just remember it's like some people actually bounce back from this quite seamlessly. So that could happen, right? Um, the great thing is if you don't bounce back totally, you know, and you need extra support in terms of, you know, helping with relationship functioning, in terms of helping with sexual functioning, there are so many effective treatments. This is not a death sentence by any means. Um, and so that's, I think, the first and foremost thing. Um, so I, I completely agree, of course, with Alex um, in terms of just sort of recognizing that there, there is this healing period that needs to happen on a physical level and even on an emotional level too, psychologically recovering from a surgery. There's usually a bit, little bit that happens along with that process too. That's where I would really encourage a person to, to make sure that we're, we're thinking about the full definition of what intimacy is. Intimacy, sometimes we do use as this use of euphemism for sexual functioning or sexual activity, but you, but intimacy is actually a lot broader than that, right? Intimacy is, um, is sitting next to your best friend and having tea together. It might be, um, you know, having a nice chat on the phone, you know, with, uh, with your mother, right. Or a parent, it might be playing a board game. It might be hugging and cuddling and watching Netflix. And in that post-op phase and, and sometimes even in the first few months, that's the kind of intimacy that we really want to focus on. If there's a partner involved, right? And so there's a desire for that real, more romantic intimacy, it might not be sexual right away, right? It might be getting a foot rub. It might be a back rub. It might be cuddling. 
Um, it might be kisses on the cheek and on the mouth, right? Um, but it, it might not be, it might not be at the place to be um, engaging in sexual activity. And so don't forget, right, that this intimacy is broader than sexual activity, but sexual activity is important for, for many, if not most people, right? You can have, um, you can have a sexual identity all on your own. Um, even if you don't have a partner. So it's important to still see, be able to see yourself as a sexual being as you bounce back um, um, from an ostomy, ostomy surgery. And so if you feel like you're struggling with that, that is where I would say talking to your stoma nurse, um, talking to a therapist, doesn't have to be a GI psychologist. If you have one available to you, that's great. Uh, but there are many, many wonderful therapists who can, who can help work on this. Um, and then of course, if you are with a partner or you're interested in having a partner, you're interested interest in dating, then you have to think about this being a two-way street, right? So it's not only about cultivating um, more neutrality or more positivity with your own body image, seeing yourself as a sexual being, but now we also have to think about your partner, right? What's their sexual functioning? How are they bouncing back to potentially walking you through and supporting you on this journey, right? It's not uncommon that, um, the partner of a person who's gone through something medical, they also have an adjustment from seeing you like their patient, right? They may have been in more of a caregiver role. That might take a little bit of, of time for them to shift back, um, to shift out of that. We actually know a lot about this um, in other health areas, and, and we're, we're starting to grow more research and, and more, more understanding in this area when it comes to inflammatory bowel disease and folks who have ostomies. But this can be a normal recovery period as well. So remembering that if there's a partner involved, there's two people, right? Um, and in general, I would say, you know, just having that open communication, people do not talk about um, sexual functioning openly. You know, we have, we have taboos there, and this is one that we don't talk about enough. Um, and so recognizing that, um, uh, you know, if you are interested and you feel like you need some support, it could be a, a sort of regular general mental health therapist. It could be a conversation with your stoma nurse. It could be a gastro psychologist and sex therapists, which are mental health professionals. There are other type of therapists who have specialty training and working on patients who have sexual concerns. Um, there are actually many wonderful sex therapists all across the country, all across the world, they're actually a lot easier to find than a gastro psychologist. Um, I can actually give a recommendation for a website um, where people can look and, and find one. And so that is very effective. And I know this is a long answer, but I just want to say one more thing is just remembering that um, just like our mind and our body are completely um, integrated, it's the same thing when it comes to sexual functioning. So whether it comes with um, difficulty with arousal, so men who might be struggling with having or maintaining an erection, uh, women who might be struggling, and this could really go, go both ways, but women who might have trouble with lubrication, maybe both, um, you know, both or all genders struggling with an orgasm. These are things that are not just physically driven. These are largely psychosocially driven. And so working with a therapist who has expertise um, in, in sexual functioning can really be one of the most effective ways to get you back um, to, uh, to sexual functioning, you know, and just making sure that you're also talking again with your stoma nurse, with your gastroenterologist, other people involved to make sure that from a medical perspective, you know, things are, things are in a good place and there aren't any concerns in that domain. Uh, I very much appreciate you sharing um, all of that, Dr. Bedell. I think this was not talked about enough when I was undergoing ostomy surgery and it was very challenging. I often had to bring up the question to my surgeon and GI myself and it was very yeah. uncomfortable. They were older men and I was this young woman and I felt like the onus was on me to ask these questions. And I think it's very, very important now that we're having these conversations to realize that there is a lot of help out there for us, like Dr. Bedell has been sharing, um, whether that's mental health providers, sex, um, uh, sex uh, therapists or counselors. I think it's very important to understand that there is a psychosocial component to this just as much as there is a physical component. For me, um, I did ask my surgeon every single time. The, the answer I've generally always gotten is about six to eight weeks, but see how you're feeling. Um, and of course, you have to take things slowly, take things gently. And like Dr. Bedell said, intimacy can come in many forms. 
you know, um, during my surgical recoveries, I will spend a lot of time with my husband watching Netflix or playing board games. And that's, that's okay. Uh, have my heating pad with me, have, you know, wh whatever I need, a blanket with me, whatever I need um, to make myself feel more comfortable. And like, I'm getting the support that I need and also the love that I need and nurturing that I need. Um, but also making sure, and I think this was a very important point that Dr. Bedell made, is making sure your partner's okay too. Um, I, I, I don't know that we stress that enough. Um, my husband's gone through a lot with my illness, especially you know with all the stigmas um, coming from his family saying not to marry me. But on top of that, you know, seeing me go through so many surgeries and with those surgeries, one of the reasons why I have a permanent ileostomy, the major reason is because of several rectovaginal fish delay. Mm -hmm. And I can't not mention this on this chat because many of us end up with ostomies as a result of fistulizing disease. Um, and this is in our lady parts or male parts and it does affect sexual function. I, I'm not gonna sit here and sugarcoat it for anybody that it doesn't, it does. I have gotten help. I have spoken to my, um, uh, to my therapist extens extensively about this. I have spoken to my gynecologist extensively about this in terms of getting the help that I need. What do I do? I am actually seeing a pelvic floor physical therapist. I see a pelvic floor physiatrist. I've had significant pelvic surgery, several stomas, as I've mentioned. And, um, you know, also rekindling, you know, sort of that fire after you've had such, you know, traumatic surgeries is really hard. Um, so between the pelvic floor physical therapy, the physiatry, getting injections, nerve blocks to the area so that I can feel more comfortable with the chronic pain issues, chronic pelvic pain issues I have. Mm -hmm. I have also worked um, with my husband extensively with a marriage counselor as well to make sure that, you know, you know, that we are, you know, sort of bonding and jiving after such major surgery. He has seen a lot of things. He has packed wounds in places that I would not have ever wanted him to pack wounds in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to say to you that there is a lot of hope for this. Um, you know, we can help our spouses. They can help us through these things. There is a way to get your sexual life back on track after uh, major surgery. I don't want anybody to lose hope. It is possible and there's a number of resources out there. Um, with that, I also wanted to move into something else that's very important in ostomy life is just day-to-day -day management. Um, you know, one of the things that I've um, faced in, in my journey is sort of peristomal skin issues um, and, you know, uh, getting those resolved has sometimes been challenging. You could be an ostomate for 10 years and you know what, something just doesn't work right anymore. You know, that the clients that you were using for a while hasn't been working the same, or, um, you know, you've gained weight or lost a little bit of weight and the, the clients just isn't working for you. Neither is a smaller size or a larger size appliance working. Like these are all like day-to-day um, factors of living with an ostomy, going to school, working, et cetera. Alex, I just wanted to have you chime in a little bit about some of these aspects of day-to-day -day management and how you sort of help your patients deal with those. Yes, thank you, Tina. Um, most uh, people living with ostomies have, um, at least based on my experience, they would usually name their stoma and that, that stoma with a name would have its own bag. Right, they always start with their like, say, randomly like Tom's uh, care kit, right? So they would call it that. That's essential to take with you on your day-to-day -day life. It has, it should have everything you need. Some people like to pre-cut their pouches. Some people uh, also bring um, a spare uh, change of clothes, right? In case of a leak. Um, however, as Tina has mentioned, if you have uh, lived with this for a while, there might be a chance that the appliance that once worked no longer works. In those instances, it's important to see um, a walk nurse. Um, people like me who specialize it. Maybe you need to be fitted with a new appliance, right? Uh, there's always other options. And um, as with any other appliance, what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another person. So there is really no general recipe to address uh, peristomal skin issues. The best way is to have uh, 
to have yourself be seen by a specialist to see what other options you have. All right. Um, for some people, the most basic cresting, te cresting technique works. However, for some, that doesn't really necessarily work. Even more so, there are, um, we know there's a myriad of brands of appliances, right? For some people, some of them just work better for them and uh, their body just uh, reacts with them more better. So it's always important to always hear uh, Wachner's um, or your provider or any uh, specialist that is part of your care team, right? Um, there's also uh, that part of um, being open to change, right? Um, no matter how you're attached to that appliance, thinking that always worked, um as you go along with this journey um sometimes it just needs updating so we just we just have to embrace that fact too absolutely alex i think those are great points i've struggled um on and off with peristomal skin issues i want to tell you there is a light at the end of the tunnel i know a lot of new ostomates reach out to me saying oh my god how do i deal with this how do i get handle on this it does get better i promise you it does and um Sometimes the irritation can just be something that lasts for a few days, a few weeks, um, but definitely don't let it go on for too long. Make sure you see your stoma nurse to get a handle on this and try different appliances or different techniques, uh, as Alex mentioned, so that you can have better quality of life. Um, just in trying to wrap up this conversation today, I did want to mention um, Certain um, support, uh, certain support groups uh, through the foundation and through the UOAA. Um, so the foundation does have a number of local chapters with local support groups. Some of them are held in person. Some are being held virtually during these COVID times. Um, UOAA also has over 300 ostomy support groups around the country. Um, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation also has this really nice program um, of mentoring through the power of two. I've taken, a, I've taken part in it. I have definitely received help, but I've also um, been on the giving end as well um, in speaking to patients who might need to make that next step into ostomy surgery. So these are resources available to you all that you all are most welcome to reach out to your um, local chapters about. Um, I wanted to just say uh, that both UOAA and the foundation have mental health provider finders on their websites. Um, I would take make use of this. Um, there are a number of mental health providers that understand the grieving process, that understand what we are going through and can help us navigate it. Um, with that, I want to say thank you um, to today's speakers gastropsychologist Dr. Elise Bedell and certified wound and ostomy nurse specialist Alex Annengallen uh, for sharing their expertise and experiences with us. Thank you to UOAA uh, for their continued partnership with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and to Takeda for their support of this program. We wish you all a very happy Ostomy Awareness Day today and always. Um, may you uh, live your fullest life always. <laughs>